uh, Gil's business were very similar in a way where it wasn't just about building the solution for their clients. They were in a space that's very consultative. Maybe I know that's really a word where when you speak with, with clients, they need to rely on your expertise. They need to, um, and, and there's different fields of expertise. So you need to bring that to the table as well, meaning that that when you, I mean, just like if you, um, I don't know, if you, if you build a house and you have an, an architect or an engineer, you know, it's not like that building a house is, is necessarily very easy. You need to have these professionals that you can trust that are doing the, the job correct. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz, real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Coders are rewarded for writing new features, not for making their code as efficient as possible. Christopher Mims recently wrote this in the Wall Street Journal. And according to that article, bloated software raises many risks and costs the U.S. alone $2.41 trillion in cybersecurity, operational failures, all sorts of other things. Okay, but it would be very easy for me to pick on coders for not being efficient, to pick on software developers, right? But are we marketers any better? Right. As we focus on getting campaigns out the door, new websites up, hitting our numbers. Ah, what do we sacrifice? That's why I love this lesson from a recent podcast guest application. And I hope it makes you stop and think too. The lesson is streamline processes to enable efficiency, smooth operations, and get rapid results, something we all may be overlooking. So I invited that applicant on to share the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories. Joining me now is Tom Amatai, co-founder and chief executive officer at Entail AI. Thanks for joining me, Tom. Hey, I'm very happy to be here. So let's take a quick look at your background where you are now. Uh, I know you were CEO at Beat Me previously. Uh, for the past four years, uh, Tom has been at Entail. It is a bootstrapped startup, and Tom manages a team of 50 on staff, along with 500 freelancers. So Tom, give us a sense. What is your day like as CEO and co-founder? Wow, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, usually it starts with a little bit of time with, with the kid in the morning before I start working. Um, but basically, um, quite busy. I think. I mean, from about nine a.m., I'm, I'm on calls. Uh, usually, um, the morning is 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 basically booked until noon, more or less. Calls with the team. Um, as part of our process, it's either, either training calls with the team or you know, like uh, status and so on. Um, then usually we have calls with clients as well. Um, Afterwards, could be calls with um, board members, investors, um, um, prospects, and so on. So it's it's most of most of the time it's pretty busy around that. It's I mean, when the company was much smaller, I had more time to get things done. Now it's a lot about like about managing more and more managing people rather than being able to work myself, which I like as well. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm just most of my days is, is I'm on calls. Yeah, so that's hard. So how do you make sure you do those things that are not urgent, but important, like that long term strategic thing, that creative thing? I know you mentioned to me, you're like walking distance from the beach and a big surfer. Like, is that your brainstorming time? Or is there some other time where you get to like, okay, what is the vision and strategy and long term thinking? So so it's actually a good point. I mean, um, I, I used to have dogs there. They were old and they died. But usually like, when I walk the dogs, it was which would used to be the, the time, you know, away from the screen. I mean, often you are still on like you on the phone when you walk them, but it's like away from the screen or like you say now, like taking a break and go surfing. Also, that's uh, that gives you that like couple hours to clean your your mind, uh, clear your thoughts. Um, so that's that. And and besides that, yeah, if if you're busy, then, then it's it's about having a great team that that can do a lot of the work with you. Or, and 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 also another technique that I found that I mean that works for me now really well is like really. Like how how we use the you know we're working with Monday now, but job management tools you know uh, work management tools to just write down all those tasks that need to happen and make sure they happen. So that's less strategic, you know, but really making sure that everything that needs to happen uh, needs to needs to happen happens in the end. 
No, very cool. Well, I do like, I mean, when you're walking the dog, you can still be on a call. I think it would yeah. be harder than surfing. You could have a pretty darn waterproof phone and maybe like a <laughs> GoPro phone in your buds, but be a little harder. Yeah, I, I, I know that some people who, who go uh, uh, swimming with headphones, but I think that's really, you know, that's that's counterproductive, the idea that uh, you know, you're disconnected there. I have a friend who goes who goes surfing. He has like, he has a watch, you know, like an, like a, an Apple watch where he can uh, answer messages and so on when he's in the water. But for me, no, I want to be disconnected at least for a couple of hours. That's really my my chance like to to clear my mind. You got to disconnect unless you've got headphones on and are listening to the How I Made It Marketing podcast while you're swimming or surfing. Just I'll plug for a few minutes. Gosh, darn it. Yeah. Um, OK, we're surfing the web enough. Right. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the lessons from your career. Uh, you said define and differentiate between experimentation and execution in your marketing activities. So can you tell us a story behind this? How do you how do you do that? So, I mean. It took me a while to realize that, but you know, often in marketing, you have to experiment all the time. I've seen recently, I've seen a post on LinkedIn from, uh, um, I think it was the CMO of Gong, Gong.io, you know, a big, big brand. And, and among other things, they mentioned how they keep on experimenting all the time with their marketing. And with marketing, you have to evolve all the time. So you must experiment. And for many people, also for myself, it took me a while to realize, but for many people, it's difficult for them to, to experiment freely because they want to succeed and then when you define something as an experiment by definition success is what you've learned from the experiment and not necessarily the the results of the experiment itself meaning if you're if you're experimenting like creating new videos for social media the experiment could be the the, the experiment's goal could be to learn how to create a video in a certain format or how to attract a certain kind of audience or whatever. But it's not necessarily the number of views or engagement that you're going to get from the video. It's a completely different thing. And so instead of saying fail fast, which is also part of it, when you define something as an experiment, you know that the goal is to learn and, and then you define what you want to learn and you feel m much uh, much more liberated or free to do what you need in order to learn that thing and you're not trying to make something that's perfect. Because if you're trying to make something that's perfect, it's going to take time, it's going to be expensive, and the learning curve is going to be much flat, f flatter than if you um, decide that you want to learn and you don't really care about the quality. It doesn't need to be pretty. It's an experiment. You want to learn something. Sometimes you can learn it in five minutes. Sometimes it takes five hours, sometimes five days. But you can be very, very quick and very efficient when you experiment. And... And when you define that with your team, with your marketing team, it makes their work much more efficient because it also takes a while for them to understand that because we're wired to try to do things in a way that, that we're successful, that we look good and so on. But when you want to learn something new, you don't, you don't need to look good, okay? Let's say you have a bakery, I often given the, the, the example, you know, you have a bakery, you bake cakes, you know, and you have great cakes and everybody loves your cakes, okay? And, and now you want to try a new recipe for a new cake. When you're trying a new recipe, you're not going to do, you're not going to experiment and sell that new recipe, you know, while you're experimenting. You're going to try it, let's say on the side, you know, do a few cakes, see if they work or not. You can try different, like a hundred iterations that you reach a recipe that you like that works. And only then you're going to put it in the bakery and start selling that cake. Not when you, not when you experiment. So it's a completely different mind frame that allows you to move, to move much faster in marketing. Can you think of a specific example from your career where you learned something surprising or counterintuitive from an experiment? Because, I mean, I love what you're saying with experimentation. One of the things I love about experimentation, as you're saying too, is it just changes the mindset. It forces you, instead of being a marketer and being executional and hitting numbers and saying, how can I get these numbers? Like, how can I get stuff from potential customers? It forces you to be curious and say, what can I learn from yeah. potential customers? And my favorite experiment that I've ever reported on. I love this one. I interviewed the team behind the Obama presidential campaign. It was a re-election campaign. Nothing political here, not taking any sides, but it was the Obama re-election campaign. And they, mm -hmm. at the time, uh, they did more A-B testing than any other marketing campaign of any type. It was like five or $600 million worth of revenue they brought in from A-B testing. And their most surprising experiment, I remember they told us uh, that I was interviewing the team behind it. And they said when they would guess beforehand, they were never better than random chance. Like you think you know as a marketer, like what's going to work? They were random chance. Mm -hmm. And the most surprising one was the subject line, hey. They had the subject line, just hey, that's it. Hey, and it was, it 
so effective for them. It even turned into memes with other like Ryan Gosling and stuff with just hey. Um, but anyway, and they never would have guessed that. So for you, Tom, can you think of a specific experiment you ran that kind of really surprised you or was kind of intuitive, really helped power the business? Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we had we had uh, plenty of of occasions where I mean when we experimented and, and, and we came up with things we didn't know. Um, it was also in my previous company, definitely. And in, in, in this one, for example, you know, in SEO uh, in, in content, most SEOs believe, you know, they live under the assumption that content, that, that Google ranks content, long content, long form content, that, that an average post on, on Google needs to be about 2000 words in order to rank well. And we've had a lot of experiments with with short content that outranks long content, um, because we experimented with different types of content, di- like different length of content. So we found out that in many instances, um, short content works really, really well. It's and and you and we learned how to define which in which instances it works better and in which cases it works uh, it doesn't work so well. So that's just an experiment. And when you see many people who think you know. All of your all of your articles, let's say you're doing like blog articles and so on, all of your articles need to be over a thousand words, and it's really not the case. So that's uh, just uh, something that came out of an experiment. By the way, the, the, this entire company was created out of an experiment that we did basically in, in you know before that. You know, we tried, we were doing a lot of automation around uh, Facebook groups and so on, um, and we said there's a lot of activity in Facebook groups. And we had an assumption that the activity in Facebook groups happens, you know, there's a lot of groups mostly around, around, you know, sharing information, looking for information and so on. So we had an assumption that people go to Facebook and not Google because they can find answers to their questions because maybe there's niches where there isn't enough information on Google or in the internet, on the internet. Um, and, and some questions may be too long and complicated that you can't find the, the, the answers online. So we started like looking at the information on Facebook groups and copying basically the topics and creating the, the, the content on, on websites just to see what works and what doesn't work. And from that, we started seeing, you know, like started doing SEO before we even knew that we were doing SEO with a different a completely different approach to like you know the 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 old school traditional keyword research approach okay and and we started generating a lot of traffic like that so that was just an experiment that we tried and it got a lot of traffic we didn't know what we were doing we were just experimenting and you know there's like a bunch of other experiments that we did um with with i know from like from conversion rate optimization to um to the way we we for example, you know, um, we create content for, we create thousands of articles every month uh, of content. And when ChatGPT came out, I mean, I was obsessed with, you know, how it's going to change the market. And I wasn't obsessed in the same way that I think most of the market is, where like how to use ChatGPT to generate content. I was more obsessed with how it's going to affect Google, because a lot of the traffic that we generate for our clients is, is organic traffic from Google. And so if in uh, what the way I perceived it in the beginning is that chat GPT is going to, is that Google is going to replace the snippets in the results with a chat GPT, like, uh, you know, bot that answers questions and that would kill the organic traffic to websites. That was my initial uh, uh, thought. Okay. And we started like experimenting and, 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 and trying to research and understand how it's going to really affect Google. And, and we went through, since November 22, when ChatGPT launched, we went through a series of, of experiments with trying to understand what content is going to still perform, like outperform ChatGPT and how it was going to change. <clears throat> and we ended up creating a completely d- different process of content creation. We stopped working with writers. We started working only with experts. You know, we mentioned, you mentioned like 500 uh, freelancers that we work with. We have... We have experts in every field that we that we create content in, in from doctors to HR managers, payroll managers, um, psychologists, you know, therapists, whatever you name it. Um, and we created a completely new way. We invented a completely new way of creating content that's that's human first content that's about very similar to what you're doing in, the, in this podcast in a way. Content that's uh, that's about sharing unique stories, unique perspectives personal experience, personal expertise, exactly what we're doing now, we found a way to do it at scale. 
And then we were using AI to create the strategy, to know what content to create, what topics to create, what's the value of every topic. Okay, so if you create content on, on, on certain topic, what's the value of that content for your business? How do you calculate the value? So we're using AI for that. We're using AI to edit the content, but not to generate the content. So all of that process um, evolved from an experimentation process that we used to, that we did daily, okay? That was like really our R&D process. How do you develop a process to create content? How do you build the tools for that? So all of that was experimentation, trial and error. How do you get to a point where you create content at a very high quality, low cost, at scale, okay? And how do you do that for many different businesses in many different industries at the same time? So it was just a series of experimentations all the time. And so once you, once you reach a point, and it's something I, I, like I remember I learned from my previous business partner, I mean, once you, once you reach a point where your experiments work and you see that, that it produces the results that you want also, and then you bring it to a, to a point where it's, where it's stable, where it's reliable, then you move it so-called into production and then you're no longer in the experiment mode. Now, now you're in production mode. Now you're in the scaling mode. And, and you, and you uh, focus on process, on making it repeatable and scalable, as opposed to just a quick uh, process of learning all the time. Right. That's where it has to become a business. And, and I think to yeah. scale, part of the thing you need is the right people on your team, right? And mm -hmm. when it comes to that, uh, here's one of your lessons. You say prioritize talent over experience when recruiting. So how'd you learn this lesson? Yeah. Tell us the story behind it. So um, it probably has to do with my, with the way I, with the way I roll, let's say. I mean, um, I often feel uh, more comfortable working with juniors because, because at the end of the day, we're a marketing company. And as a marketing company, we do need to experiment a lot. So you need people who are humble. Um, we, th we don't think they know, okay? And it's usually easier with, with younger people. Um, and so for that, we, we developed also through experimentation, we developed a process of, of recruiting people, testing people and recruiting them. Right now we have a process of, of we're able to test a thousand people a day without like automatically without doing anything. And out of those thousand people, we'll recruit only one person who is a good fit. And, and I mean, the, the um, the percentage of the success rate is, is very high. Um, and and by testing them, we can test their talent rather than their CVs and so on. We're not looking at CVs at all. We're just testing their capabilities in the specific things, that, the specific challenges that we would like them to solve. And then we, when you have uh, talented people like that, it's much easier to experiment and to move quickly, which is part of the DNA of, of our company, that we need to move quick. We need to be able to experiment and we need to be able to execute very quickly. And it's either, easier with people that are very talented um, that can learn quickly rather than people who, who just have a, you know, a very long, uh, an impressive CV sometimes. I'm not saying that people can't have an impressive CV and, and still be very professional, but in this line of business, when you need to be very, very quick, when you find people that are very talented and if the company is, is structured in that way, they can become productive very quick. And they can even be managers in, in about a year or two. And we have, we have a, few, a few of those very, very talented, very nice people I enjoy working with. And I think they've learned a lot since they started working with us. Um, you should ask them, you know, they can, they can <laughs> attest to that. Um, but I mean, I appreciate them a lot. And I think, uh, um, I think the point we've, re we've reached with them, with uh, many of them, is... Would, would have been much more difficult to reach with a person that has a lot of experience and not necessarily the same talent as, as they do. Can you give us a specific example of how you test for talent? Because when you say this idea, I feel like it sounds good to people. Okay, talent's more important than experience. Yet when you look at most job openings out there, they're experience focused, right? You need five years of Google Analytics or whatever, right? It's kind of silly because, well, that's something anyone can learn. But I think we do that job, you know, uh, managers do that because they, that's something they can easily measure. I can see yeah. if you've had five years experience in this. I mean, one test that worked for me for talent is I would hire a copy editor for marketing Sherpa. I would intentionally put a typo in the job posting. And I did this for a few reasons. One, if you're interviewing someone, everyone says they have attention to detail. No one in an interview or in a cover letter is saying, I have poor attention to detail, right? You actually yeah. have to see if they do or not. And when people are being tested, 
they're usually a little more focused than when they don't know they're being tested. But the other reason I did it was because the job of a copy editor, it's two things. It's not just to, to find a mistake or to fix it or make the grammar good or all those things. It's also how, how they communicate with the writer, right? And so mm-hmm. sometimes people would come in and they weren't humble at all. They'd be like, they drop it like on the on the on the table in the conference room. Look at this mistake you made. You need to hire me. Like, look at that. You yeah. had a mistake even in your job posting. My gosh. And they were not a fit at all, right? Because they're not going to work well with our writers. But yeah. the people that came in, you know, they do the interview and at the end they kind of humbly say, I remember this one of the last copywriters I hired, you know, sir, like, hey, I just wanted to mention I found this in your in your job posting. There was a little mistake. Maybe it was intentional, I don't even know. But you know what I mean? Like that person that was humble and kind of thought well of the other side. And you're like, okay, that's not just someone who one has a talent to find mm-hmm. it, but will fit in well with the team and the culture and be someone you want to work with and spend time with, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So for you, like, do you have a specific example? How do you test and find talent? That's not easy. Yeah, so it's actually very specific and it also probably has to do with my background, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm from, from Israel, so I had to go to the army and, and that's basically how it's built in the army. I mean, the army is, is, is a huge operation that every year takes young kids, 18 years old, and turns them into soldiers. And I actually had, I mean, we're, we call ourselves a bootstrap company, even though we did raise uh, money from some investors, but we basically that's a buffer in the bank and, and we, we live off of, off our, our, you know, our, our revenues. But I was talking to one of our, my investors who's a, an Air Force, uh, you know, fighter jet pilots. And often Israelis, you know, they, uh, they brag that they have the best pilots in the world. Um, you know, when when they do drills, you know, against the U.S., they usually beat them like 100 to 1 or so. That's the ratio. But um, so, I, so I was talking, I had this conversation with him about recruiting managers. And I asked him, you know, how many, uh, how many pilots in your, uh, in your squadron were recruited from different uh, air forces, not from the Israeli Air Force? He said, what do you mean? I said, exactly that, like zero, right? Everybody was trained there and they, and they became very successful. So how do you, how do you sort out the people and how do you train them very quickly? And so the entire company, I mean, Intel is structured like that. First of all, we define exactly what are the, the capabilities and, and the skills that every role needs to have. And then we define tests to test that. So for example, we deal a lot with content. So we, so most of our people, they need to have, they need to really understand intent in content and they need to know how to edit content they need to be good with words basically okay so we test those two things so for example for intent the the way we test uh there's very simple principles that we use first of all what we want to test is your ability to understand intent not the ability to understand the test itself because sometimes for myself i'm not very good with following instructions that may be one of the reasons why i started a company okay so i so i don't want to test the capability of following instructions exactly but actually getting the, the answer right to understand intent. So we start, we, we, we create a test. It, it's divided into a few, a few steps, a few parts. And for every part, we have basically the same question or the same type of question repeating. So if it was a math test, for example, then it was like, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, two plus two, three plus three, you know, like the same type of, of, of math a problem that repeats itself. So if it's like testing, understanding intent, then you need to, you need to be able to define the intent in, in a sentence. Okay. And you start with very, very simple uh, questions that everyone is going to get right. And it's, it's a multiple choice test. So you don't need to test to check the results. You get it automatically from, you know, you just see if, if they got it right or not. So they start with, they get the instructions, they get an example, then they get five super simple, uh, um, questions that they're going to get right and then it gets more and more and more and more and more difficult and it's like about 20 iterations like that and then you have another part and another part and another part like that and if they if they ace the first part they move to the second part the third part the fourth part etc and then you you're able to test different aspects of understanding intent in text okay because that's part of what they need to understand then then uh, you can do the same thing for editing tests you can do the same thing for designers test you know it can be a multiple choice uh test where you like testing if they can see alignment if they really have attention to detail so you show them a few a few options and they need to decide which option is best so so we're able to to publish these tests and reach you know like thousands of people usually it's about a thousand people per day who start the tests and maybe like five will, will pass and get like, and like the more pass, you know, you can increase the, the bar, you know, you can like the threshold. So you, you just eventually, if they pass the test, if they're from 
the, the, the same time zone as ours, the countries that we can work with. And if their salary expectations uh, meet ours, then we call them for an interview. And if they're nice people and, and, and you know, people that we can communicate with and people that we would like to work with, uh, then we hire them. And, and usually these people, like our success rate is above 90%. Okay, with this, so don't, we don't have to fire a lot. So that's part of it. Another part of it, which is the part that most companies don't have, this is why this thing will not work for them, but we developed at Intel, is we built our company in a way that, and that's another principle. So one principle is testing very quickly without that taking time. The other principle is that they need to be productive in the first hour on the job. Okay, because I don't I don't want them to waste time now, you know, like with like long uh, um, training and so on. So they pass the test. They, it means that they have the basic skills and and, you know, they can just basically go into the factory line, go, so to speak. OK, and so they don't. So they touch they, they're in production from from the first minute on the job. <laughs> but they're not allowed to submit anything to clients and so on. So there's like, there's an, a, a services aspect to our business. So we built it like this so we can scale quickly. And so they can do a lot of the work, but everything they do gets reviewed by a more senior person. And this is how it's built like a pyramid like that. Again, very similar to how the army is structured. Okay. And it, it makes them uh, very effective very quickly. So we can move very quick. We can recruit people very quick. We can invent things very quickly. Okay. And create new processes very quickly. Um, so it gives us a lot of advantage. And then when we ba basically dev, you know, like the R and D, um, then, you know, has to keep up with that pace. So like developing the tools that we need in order to, to, to like streamline the processes that we're working on. But then I imagine you do have to train those people also. And, and you mentioned, uh, your next lesson, provide talented yet inexperienced people with frequent short training sessions and support as they tackle new challenges. So how do you do that? I mean, that kind of sounds similar to what would happen in the military as well, right? You got your basic training and you go on from there. Yeah, so uh, it, it's it's what I mentioned now. I mean, it's very true. You can't just expect them to be professionals from from the first minute on the job, right? So so they need, um, what what we figured out is that if they get um, so if people that you recruit get, um, instead of having like a long training, uh, period or long training sessions, you let them, you let, you give them tasks that, that are tasks that you need for production for what you're doing. So it means that they're important and you just check in with them quite often. So it really depends on what you're teaching them, but you can check in with them like three times a day or five times a day, it really depends on what they're doing. And then then gradually you can reduce the, the amount of times that you need to check in with them, okay? So you can um, you can check in with them, you know, in the first week, they could check in with them like three, four times a day. Every time is about 15 minutes. So what have you done? Let's go over this, what, what uh, you can improve or what you should improve, what you should do differently and so on. And then they learn, they're open to learn because they're juniors, so they're still open. And when you when you do it like that, you don't um, you don't burden them or you don't over overload them with too much information. You're just giving them, you know, like small bites as much as they can chew, you know, at each given moment. And by doing that, they they learn on their own. You know, they try something on their own. They get feedback, and then they basically learning by doing is much faster than trying to learn by like just like theory or intellectual learning so they do that on their own and then they get feedback and then they improve and they get feedback and they improve and then the learning curve is very very steep they can move very very quickly and it works really well with those like uh, very short feedback uh, sessions so you don't waste, waste too much time trying to explain things that are for people who are like maybe um premature and understanding like more complex things that it will take them you know, another week or another month or another year to be able to understand. So again, you give them as much as they can absorb, as much as they can learn at the moment, and then you let them keep on keep on working. All right. So this sounds like a really well-oiled machine, but for things mm -hmm. that you are well experienced in and know well, I think one challenge that a lot of startups have, especially bootstrap startups as they grow, is there are going to be areas they need to grow in that they are not expert in. So I wonder if you have a specific example of how you handled one of those areas or scaled up. Like, for example, I interviewed uh, Dan Garcia, the CMO of the Providence Blockchain Foundation on How I Made It Marketing. And one of his mm -hmm. lessons was, 
make up for areas where you're not as strong. And he talked about when he first became a director at a Fortune 300 company, he was only 26. And, you know, he did what we all did at first is you're just trying to go for, you know, your strength, you know, like attracts like. And, you know, senior leaders taught him, no, you've got to counterbalance your skills to balance out what your actual team needs, what the company needs. So for you, Tom, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of startups, especially bootstrap startups, they need to grow in certain areas. Well, they don't have a subject matter expertise in that yet. You've got that well-oiled machine to train people for that when you do have that uh, expertise. How do you grow? Do you have a specific example how you've been able to add skills that you didn't already have in the company? So first of all, you can, you can recruit juniors that have... Um, that have the skills or have the talent that you lack. And I, and we have many of those, many of them are much better than I am uh, in many things um, from content creation, editing, developing, uh, redesigning, or, you know, uh, you name it. Um, but for us, again, for us, our DNA is, is about moving quickly, being able, able to experiment and, and develop things very quickly. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay. So we create a lot of content and, and in order to create that content, we need to decide, I mean, if it's SEO, for example, we need to like people do keyword research, right? So we had about 20 people, um, analysts, like researching, you know, what topics to create content on. And what, and, and I have, I have had no, no prior experience in, in SEO. So we did get an outside, you know, uh, consultants, you know, just that, that helped us, you know, like filling the gaps, but it wasn't as significant as the process that we've done in-house. What we've done is, is we've worked with that team. So I would do every day, two meetings with this team of like 20 analysts every day, reviewing one of their, like taking one of them or like in each meeting, meeting, taking one of them and going over the strategy that they created for one of our clients. Okay. Content strategy, going over that. And the entire team had to use the same format exactly to what they were working on. And every meeting we would iterate, we would change it and everybody would have to align. So it would be 20 people in the meeting going over one of the the the, uh, the guys' uh, work. Actually, it's mostly women, not men. I don't know what, why, but that's how it is. They're very talented. Not all of them, but many of them are. So every day they would have to go uh, over what like that person did learn from that, think together wow, how we can improve it, what we can change. And then everybody would have to go and change their formats to what this person has done. Okay. And it would change twice a day. And we went like this for a few months, every day, changing, changing, evolving, evolving. If, if you're talking about, you know, R and D research and development, that was the research. And then we reached a very, very, very solid model that we then turned into our own model. We call it the topical authority graph. It's basically an upside down model of how Google works, how you can map all the topics of a website. Now we do it automatically, okay? We do it with AI, but how you map all the topics that are relevant to a website and, and understand exactly what is the value of each topic. So it took us a while. We worked on this with 20 people, iterated every day, and in, in an area that we didn't know much about, but we just decided that we're going to research that, okay? And we reached a point where, where the model works, worked really well, as much as you could do manually. And then we said, okay, now we're going to turn this into software. And we did. And now this is, this is a model that, that maps, you, you, you give it a website, it maps all the relevant topics. It can be hundreds of thousands of different topics and, and the value of each topic and, and you know, the priority of when you want to create content for that, either for... SEO or for social media, it's basically, it does all the strategy automatically. And it was only through experimentation and research. Well, in the first half of the podcast, we talk about lessons you learn from things like building your AI SEO model. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. In the second half of the podcast, we're going to talk about lessons you learn from people you collaborated with. Because that's the great thing we get to do as marketers. We get to build things and we get to mm -hmm. build them with people. But before we do that, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. MechLabs AI now has expert yeah. assistance, copywriter, project planner, marketing professor, social media pro, and email assistant. It's totally free to use for now. So just go to mechlabsai.com and start using it. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S-A-I.com to get 
artificial intelligence working for your marketing. All right, so let's take a look at some lessons from the people you collaborated with. Uh, here's a lesson you said, capitalize on opportunities when they present themselves, even if you don't fully understand their potential value at first. Kind of ties into what you're saying about experimentation. You said you learned this from Shay Yitzhak, the founder of gambling site triple eight.com. How'd you learn this from Shay? Um, so Shai was a dear friend. I mean, I told you this is a picture of him uh, right behind me. He died four years ago. I think it was four years ago, beginning of COVID. Yeah. Um, so uh, he was a brilliant person and, and I've learned a lot from him. I mean, we had the company, he was my partner in my previous company, partner and investor. And, and basically we would sit down like, you know, at least like twice a week. And he was a person, you know, IPO the company for over a billion dollars. So he managed over a thousand people. And I've learned many things from him. And often what, what would happen uh, when we were having conversations, he would come to me and say, you know what? I've been up all night. I've had this thought that we must go in, you know, in this direction, whatever. And I would tell him, you know, I have, I think completely the opposite. I think we should go in the opposite direction. And he would say, okay, you know, it was that easy, you know, to change his mind. And, and, and he told me a lot of stories about how he, um, how he really capitalized on opportunities, you know, as, as you know, you're working very hard, you're trying new things, you're building new things. And then all of a sudden an opportunity shows up and often people will not really capitalize on it because it's not what they planned or because they're too busy doing another thing, but that's how it was for him. So he told me, you know, like, like, uh, one of his stories, um, uh, building a triple eight online gambling. And so it's 888.com, right? So in the beginning, they used to be called, so they started with, as, a, as a solution for, um, they built games for, the idea was, uh, what was it? To build games for, for like uh, online, you know, like, like they call it like supermarkets, you know, it was back in the, the end of the 90s, okay? So they, they built games, so if you're shopping online, you won't be bored or something. And of course it didn't work, but they saw that people are playing with the games and then they shifted to, um, they shifted to online gambling. So that was one way they capitalized on an opportunity. But their name in the beginning, the name of the website, their domain was Casino on Nets. It says even his parents, if they wanted to see what this website was looked like or whatever, they couldn't spell it right. So like it was a difficult name for many people to spell right. And and it says like they were already like a, quite a big company. They were making quite a lot of money. I mean, probably like over like a million dollars a month um, at that time. And one of the employees in the company, which I don't remember his name because I'm, I never stepped foot in that company, but I heard a lot of stories. So one of the employees came to him and told him, you know, I just came back from a trip to China. And you know, the people in the Far East, they're really obsessed with numbers. They really love numbers. And, and I saw that there's this domain available for purchase and it's uh, 888.com. Maybe we should buy it. And he said, ah, you know, it's not important. Let's leave it, you know? And he said like, you know, in the evening, he grabbed his head and said, what? Am I, am I an idiot? And he just called the guy, said, let's go buy that domain. And so they went in, in through hoops, you know, just to make sure they go and buy the domain through uh, like, uh, like uh, without telling the person they were buying it from that they're like already like a successful company. So he doesn't charge them too much. And they ended up buying it for not that expensive. Uh, um, it wasn't that expensive, I think, when they bought it. And, you know, it, it ended up being like a, a billion dollar company. And a lot of it was also because of the domain. That's that's uh, super easy to remember. By the way, later they also purchased uh, 777.com and built another like affiliate site on that. And it was sold for about $20 million down the line. But that's just one of the stories about, you know, uh, capitalizing on opportunities. So you mentioned, I think Shai was an investor in uh, one of your previous companies. You had a, you were CEO of a startup of a funded company. Now, while you do have some funding, you're taking a bootstrapped approach. Can you give us a sense? What are the pros and cons or what are the different considerations? If there are any, maybe we should do everything the same between a funded company when you're taking on funding, private equity funding, whatever you see capital, whatever it might be versus bootstrapping and just kind of, you know, doing it yourself. Can you give us a sense? Yeah, so uh, it's it's very different. Um, you know, there's often there's a lot of uh, tension or stress or anxiety or whatever that has to do with you know running a business. So I think bootstrapping is a different type of tension than uh, than if you raise money from investors. The the basic difference is that if you go down the VC path, then you're basically tra planning for uh, a runway of uh, let's say a year and a half more or less. And you raise money and you're planning to grow very quickly and then basically burn all this money and then raise raise again. 
And, and what I've seen, you know, working with many clients, uh, most of them are funded companies, is um, is that they because they want to grow very quickly, they recruit people in a completely completely different way than than we do. They look for people with experience, and so it's very difficult to to recruit a person like a manager. I would say, depending on the role between sales and marketing and then um, the dev and so on, if you're trying to recruit managers, the success rates uh, aren't very high. Okay. And so, but when you have to grow very quickly, you need to, re- you need to recruit people with a lot of experience. So that's one challenge that we don't necessarily have. We can grow more slowly and, and, um, uh, but more, um, how to say, um, more, more like to have a more sustainable process. And I mean, we started the company, you know, back, back then it was like back during COVID, you know, like companies were like, like raising money, like left, right and center, right? Like, like huge rounds. And so money was very cheap. And I saw companies like throwing money away, you know, out the window all the time. And then, and then the market shifted. And then all of a sudden, you know, now there's still like layoffs and all that. And when we are a very, very efficient company, we don't throw money away. We don't waste money. So for us, the, the kind of like this downturn in the market didn't really affect us that much. I mean, it was, for us, it was, I mean, we did lose a few clients that had no budget anymore, or companies that were shut down because of that. Uh, but for us, for our company, it didn't really change much because we were, we were working very efficiently like that um, and not, not, not burning money, being basically either break even or a bit profitable all the time. So, because you invest more in, in, in growth. Um, so we didn't have that that type of tension of of having to like grow very quickly, recruit people very quickly, burn all this money, raise another round, tell your investor stories all the time, or you know like having to pitch to investors all the time. So we don't have that. We have more freedom. We have more um, wiggle room in a way because we don't need to raise money all the time. You mentioned you're so, an efficient company. Let's talk about efficiency. This is something I talked about mm-hmm. in the open. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mentioned software developers, they have technical debt. That's well known. Uh, and I don't know, we don't really have a term for it in marketing, but I, I often think about it sometimes like um, in World War II, after America got burnt, bombed by Pearl Harbor, there's a very famous Doolittle's raid where America just wanted to say that, hey, we can hit Japan. Uh, and so General Doolittle led it. Uh, the problem was we didn't really have the right equipment. So we had these big bombers that needed long runways, but they couldn't fly far enough to Japan. And then we had these smaller planes that could take off of an aircraft carrier. So what they did is they decided we're going to use these big bombers, but we're going to make them light enough that they could take off on an aircraft carrier. So they basically just took these planes and they threw everything off them, the machines, anything that had any weight, just so they could take off on that short runway. They bombed mm-hmm. Japan and then they just crash landed in China because they didn't even have enough gas to get back. And I, it's, to me, it was such an analogy of how sometimes I see marketers approach things in some marketer campaigns where they just they just throw everything out the window. Let's throw everything we can at it. Let's hit our numbers this quarter. And again, I think something that's overlooked in that fact is some of the things like efficiency. So I love this lesson. This really is what caught my eye in your podcast guest application. Streamline processes to enable efficiency, smooth operations, and get rapid results. Again, we just overlooked this to try to hit our numbers. You said you learned this from Lior Witznitzer, the Director of Organic Growth and Natural Intelligence. So how did you learn this lesson? So, I mean, uh, we've been working with natural intelligence um, for, for a long time now few years and they're an amazing company and um they're one of the biggest advertisers on google on google globally you know i think if i'm not mistaken google built their offices they spend about half a billion dollars a year on google okay and and when you advertise so much and in and in paid advertising the margins aren't aren't huge okay so when you advertise so much and the margins aren't huge you have to be very 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 efficient in order to you know to make as, as much money as possible to 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 keep your margins as 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 wide as possible so so for a company like that every you know fraction of a percentage is worth a lot of money so if you compare them by the way to let's say an insurance company we worked with insurance companies okay like online insurance they they can be an online business they can be in in marketing and so on but they're an insurance company at the end of the day so there's bureaucracy, there's a lot of red tape, everything takes forever, and nothing is moving. And also in the marketing department, it's the same thing. But when you look at, at natural intelligence, 
everything it just just ticks everything moves very quickly there's even there's almost no red tape over there even i mean they're a big company they're about 500 and something employees there's a they're a tech company um very serious people very talented people very nice people also a uh, very good culture and everything is just streamlined when they need something they get it when the team needs uh, something developed they get it. Um, when they build something, they build a team and they build it very quickly. When they need to execute, they execute. It doesn't take, uh, there's no ego involved. It doesn't take forever, like I see in many, many other companies. And the impact that they can have, because at the end of the day, they're, they are a marketing company. Okay. And that's the main difference between being a marketing company or being a marketing department within a company. Since the entire company is does marketing, all the processes are super, super streamlined. It's a very well-oiled machine. Everything runs super smoothly and their impact is huge. What they can do is huge. And if they operate like many other companies that, that we see, um, where there's like, you know, it takes them a super long time to make decisions and so on and get approval. I mean, I've worked with companies who told us they wanted to to um, to work with us? You know, they wanted to use our platform, and it took them four months since they made the decision till they signed the agreement. It took them four months. You know, they got the agreement on the, the agreement on the same day. You know, so with natural intelligence, that doesn't happen. They, I mean, they did uh, they did do a very thorough due diligence before they started working with us. You know, we had a few meetings with them, like 10 people in every meeting. They, they interviewed our, the other uh, clients that we have and so on. But once they decided they were, they were going for this, like everything was open. There were no roadblocks. There was no o- obstacles. Integration. It was a team working on integration, you know, from day one. Very talented people, very quick uh, integration was done. And I, every different track moved like super, super, super smoothly. In, in, including procurement and legal and everything super, super smoothly. Can you give us a specific example of how you built something from the ground up for efficiency? Because as I mentioned, like I think a bad way to do efficiency is what many companies do. They do it on the back end, right? Which is essentially layoffs. They realize, oh no, we have too much overhead. We're going to like cut people back. Let's see if we can keep this thing running still, right? And as I mentioned, a lot of times when we're, you know, we're trying so hard to, to get something going quick, you know, it takes longer to make it efficient or to do it right from the outset, which is why we don't, especially for technical oriented companies, you know, because there are certain ways to build things and get it up that aren't the best for long term to maintain it and keep it going. Kind of like I mentioned that Wall yeah. Street Journal article in the beginning. So do you have a specific example of how you built something from the ground up to be efficient? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, our, I mean, Intel AI, our company, the entire company is built like that. And, and going back to my, my partner, my previous company, Shai, um, and he built uh, 888.com and it, it was a gambling company, but gambling companies are marketing companies at the end of the day. They need to be very, very good at marketing. And he used to tell me, you know, if we can do acquisition, if we can acquire customers at 10% or 20% cheaper than our competitor, this is where our money is at. This is our margin. This is our profit. This is how we win. Okay. So it is about being more efficient. It is about spending less on acquisition than the, than your competitor. And in order to do that in marketing, you have to be super efficient because, you know, there's a lot of money falling through the cracks, a lot of money wasted on, on processes that are very long. So this is the principle. And for example, at Intel, um, Intel is an organic marketing company, okay, marketing platform. So our platform supports teams that, that need to create content for, for social media or for SEO, text and video. And so, for example, like the story I told you before about how we used to develop content strategy with 20 analysts, okay? We did this. So in the beginning, it was one person. Then we had more clients, more and more clients. So we, we recruited more people. It became an entire organization of analysts just for the strategy part of things. So we were iterating again and again, like every day in, day out, until we built a model manually that worked, and then we developed it into a product. And now instead of 20 analysts that, that need to do content strategy, we have only one person and we have more clients than, than back then, just one person working with, with the platform. And now it's reached the point where the clients can use the platform and the clients use it as, as SaaS. 
So that's how we developed SAS based on the, on the research that we did for our cli- clients. And this is how we ensured that this is super, super, super efficient because we were using it for ourselves. So it's definitely like eating your own dog food. That's the principle. So we did that with creating content strategy. Then we have another process of uh, how you create content. Today I spoke with a, uh, with a prospect, one of the biggest companies for, for uh, uh, female tech. They have a few million visitors in, on their website every month. Um, they have a team, they have at least 10 people reviewing every content piece before they publish it. It takes them eight weeks to publish a content piece, okay? And they have thousands of articles on their website. And so I show them our CMS and we, I mean, we do thousands of articles for not for one industry, for but for dozens of industries. Each one of them can be completely different and, and, and our clients hold us to very, very high standards, in fact, higher than they would hold themselves to, okay? So we needed to create uh, a system that would allow us to create content at this level, at this quality, at scale, very, very quickly and inexpensively. So we built a, we built an entire product for that, where where multiple people can can work on every content piece. It can go, it goes basically through a kind of a pipeline. That's our until CMS. That's how it works. So people can so there's strategy. Strategy gets approved. Then it's it's uh, it it creates a brief. The brief get a, gets approved, and then it goes to the expert. The expert creates the content. This content is edited into video and text, and it goes through editing steps. And for each step, the stakeholder can go in, make edits, change, and insert comments, and so on. It goes on from one step to the other until it is approved by the client and published to their social media or, or to the website. And so by doing that, you can have a very solid strategy that ensures results. You can have the stakeholders approve the content because we've seen this process is very, very fragmented. Different stakeholders need to approve, need to, everybody needs to chip in. So we built a system where every stakeholder can approve the content before it gets published. Okay, or before it goes on to the next step, and it can also be sent back. So we just built a product to support exactly that. So that was about efficiency. Then we built another product. We saw that many companies, you know, every every company tries to kind of like reinvent the wheel when they build content on their website. They build pages, they do the own page SEO, they do the design, etc. So we built we built our own page builder that can work with any website that just builds content pages that can be easily customized into every website, any website you want, any platform you want, we can integrate with anyone and you don't need to do all the SEO work. So this also saves time. It saves a lot of time because when you start doing building pages for SEO, you build it, then you test, then it takes a couple of months, then you make another change. It can take a year to reach like a stable version. So for us, it's like a plug and play. You just connect it to your website and it works. So that's what Intel provides, you understand? So also in terms of like solving on-page SEO and all the technical SEO part, it's done. And then we have, then we started seeing, you know, some websites have issues, you know, like uh, SEO issues, sometimes the pages are down, you know, you have downtime, you have pages that load too slow, you know, you have a bunch of problems. So we built our own, our own crawler that crawls our clients' websites and tells them if there's issues and now they can get alerts in our system. So you don't need to go and manually do like uh, site audits. You, you get it live on your website all the time. So that's what and we've done the same thing with, with um, conversion rate optimization. You know, companies end up with thousands or hundreds of thousands of, 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 of pages of content pages on the website and they can track the conversion because analytics uh, most of the analytics products are not built for that they have analysts like looking at different blogs looking at different pages how much traffic they're getting how many click throughs they're getting from these pages on to the to the you know further down the funnel in by the way most of them don't, don't really do they just create content and they don't really know if it converts or not that's true to 99% of the companies so we built a system that can map all the topics of the website that's a strategy and then see every topic as a, as a campaign, like how much is it, how much is the, the value of the tra- of that topic? How much traffic is it getting? How many conversions is this topic getting? And is it getting, and, and what's the difference between the value and the actual sales it generates? If the difference is big, we can optimize for more traffic or for, for more conversions. And by doing that, we've optimized the entire conversion rate optimization process. So now you can, you can optimize thousands of pages 
as opposed to being to just you know optimize your your landing pages and your, and your homepage. So all of those things are parts of optimizations that enable you to increase your reach, increase your acquisition, and also lower your acquisition costs. So it gives you a huge advantage in, in marketing. So doing all those things, doing automated technical things are a way to be efficient, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Removing the human element is a way to be efficient. But you also said uh, one of your lessons, combine platform expertise with consultative service that builds client trust. You said you learned this from Gil Shoham, founder of Supersonic Ads. So where do you add in that human element? How did you learn this from Gil? Yeah. So, I mean, Gil is, is an investor and a partner in a company and he sold supersonic ads to Iron Source. And even though it uh, what they dealt with, um, what Iron Source deals with is more like uh, um, um, monetization for, for mobile uh, gaming. Uh, so it's a different field, but still it, it was very similar in a way. Uh, Gil's business was very similar in a way where it wasn't just about building the solution for their clients. They were in a space that's very consultative. Maybe I don't know if that's really a word where when you speak with, with clients, they need to rely on your expertise. They need to, and, and, and there's different fields of expertise. So you need to bring that to the table as well. Meaning that, that when you, I mean, just like if you, um, I don't know if you if you build a house and you have an, an architect or an engineer, you know, it's not like that building a house is, is necessarily very easy. You need to have these professionals that you can trust that are doing the, the job correct. And when you need to build a lot of content, it's like building equity for your brand. You need to know that you're doing it right. You need to know that you're not making mistakes, that this content is going to perform, that it's not going to kind of like, there can be cannibalization of, you know, creating the same content that competes with, with you know, same pieces competing with each other. Um, there can be performance issues. There can be a lot of issues when building something like that, just like when you build a house. So you need to have the right engineers. And for that reason, you need to be able to bring into the table, to bring to the table, um, experts in each part in each field that is involved for example seo so it can be technical seo and the strategy part you need to have people who are content experts in terms of the of how to create the right content you need to have subject matter experts that can create content um you know if it's if it's like medical content okay you need to have doctors you need to have fact checkers so you need to bring all that expertise to the table to create trust with the client because trust is a very important part of 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 that business and by the way um it's also a very important part of how you market in in a business that requires trust from its clients it's also a very important thing that you need to solve in your marketing as well so from your marketing itself uh, prospects can trust you as well well we talked about so many different things about what it means to be a marketer tom what it means to build a company all this if you had to break it down what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Wow, that's uh, that's a difficult one. I mean, so I, I can only basically, so first of all, I can only tell you like my opinion because there's many people that are very, very different than me and can be super successful. Um, I'd say that it depends on the type of marketing that you're doing. You know, some people are like, um, I don't know, like Neil Patel, for example, if you know him uh, in SEO. So he's built his own personal brand. So that's one way of going uh, at things. If you have that charisma and that dedication, other people are more dedicated to the numbers. They can be like uh, amazing uh, performance marketers. So it really depends on on kind of like what school of marketing you're in. Um, but I definitely think that, that the ability of, of experimenting, the ability to experiment and to fail without being afraid to fail is one of the most important qualities. Um, because in marketing, you never know if it's going to work or not before you try it. So I think, um, I think this is the most important quality. Well, thanks for sharing all these lessons from your career, Tom. I learned a lot. And thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Thank you.